it's a little bit different topic, to be honest. That's a huge difference. Maybe it's a little bit more into the female urology because the recurrent infections of the lower urethral infections. That's of course the situation which is more often caused in females. But we may also do have some of those infections with males. But there would be different pathophysiological mechanisms and there would be different peculiarities. In those key scenarios, that's where I represent the female urological section and I deal with female urological quite a lot with inconsistency of the of, of urine and this is rather familiar so what do we know the infections of the lower genital tract infections that's one of the most often infections seven million examinations and addresses in the united states seven million incidents cases in the united states and 20 percent probably on the cases in the outpatient facility examination but what's the reason that's a shirhia coli in most of the cases but uropathogenic strains because there are different kind of shirhia coli a lot of different deviations and rather often it is not harmly it does not harm it just lives inside the tract and it does not dominate there because there are different families of the bacteria which dominate in the intestine and because of some unknown reasons still, the Shurhi coli just starts to behave really aggressively. It gets with some kind of genetic factors, some kind of aggressive genes, some migration genes, some metabolic changes, the topics of education, the genes of education, and then Shurhi coli just transforms in uropathogenic form of Shurhi coli, which emigrates from the intestine to the first localization to the urinary tracts, but it might also get into the nervous system, it might also get into the blood circulation and might lead to, to issues with systemic sepsis. But where do we get it from? We already mentioned that we know that it is colonized in the perianal region and then it colonized uh, the vagina and then the place where how it might move from the vagina to the upper reproductive tracts but also into the urinary bladder and this is the exact point which we are kind of interested in right now we really know well that the shrihir coli is highly recurrent and you might see that the incidence is more than five times during the year and it is present in more than half of our females. But we talk that there are some females which are not going to have at least one case of cystitis. But it really is that sometimes one episode and sometimes that's just an endless amount of those cases which have a rather harmful influence on its social status, on its quality of life. Why there is such huge recurrence? Because that's an efferent factor and also the persistence in the bladder wall. The Efferent infections were mentioned for quite a lot of time. The efferent infections, afferent infections were mentioned by one of the scientists from the United States, Thomas Stempi, and he has the same concept going on right now. In 2006, there was a trial, the study, which was comparing the different stereotypes of the stereotypes of domination of Shirhiko in the intestine, and at that moment, were received from the ureus. So in most of the cases there were the same stereotypes and it was shown that we have the same stereotypes in the bladder, the same as we have in the intestine. So about the hygiene of the general hygiene, we just recommend that to our patients in most of the cases, but as you may see, just the usage of antibacterial soap is not enough and it does not deliver the wanted result and we need also to have the parallel antibiotics with the hygiene. But for quite a long period of time of prescription, we know that it does not lead to anything good besides the side effects, the antibiotic therapy, I mean, and also what's the most important, it also leads to antibacterial resistance. And also the changes of microflora of intestine, the change of microflora of Vagina, that's another topic. Why can't we treat or what can we cure this infection? And this is a question which we are getting asked to our own. And a couple of years ago, there is in the European Association of Urologists a new guidelines where there was mentioned that demonosa 
in 2000 milligrams has shown that it is extremely important in case there is a chronic recurrent infection. I'm not talking about the first episode of infection, but I'm talking about how to cure, how to get away from another recurrence, because each recurrence is going to lead to some kind of changes of epithelium of the bladder or to mucosa, and which might lead to the syndrome of painful bladder. And those demonosa studies they were just doing a change of practice, in my approach at least, but in guidelines there is just one scene mentioned about this kind of state and this drug. So why there is a colonization? You know that intracellular bacteria, Ischuhia coli, by using its pewis it gets to the umbrella cells of the bladder and then they get inside the cell and there are some additional factories inside the cell some factories, so to say, not factories, factories, where the Shirke are colonized and where they stay. So in this slide you might see just some normal mucosa of those umbrella cells over there and over there after the colonization of Shirke Koi, how they're just, you know, living in there. Some electronic microscope scans over here, you might see the same over here, those rods over there in the intraepithelial, in, in the mucosa of weather. So classic forms of antibiotics do not work. The short protocols, one, three days, what do we use usually sometimes in, in case of recurrences? It's not enough. And long-term courses lead to antibacterial resistance. And there is always a question. Is it the same strain every time there is a recurrence? Yes. The same serological subtypes, the same serotypes, the same serotypes are in 46-80%. So once the Shriki Koli went into the cell, they know where they are located, they have the new generations. And there are some virulent factors, for example, adhesion factors, as I mentioned before, because inside the intestine there are completely different resources, but also in the body there are other sources of nutrition. And this is here, Koli gets those genes which are making her possible to survive inside the urine, inside the urinary bladder. But virulence factors are also responsible for adhesion. They're extremely important because those factors are collected inside the phylogenical types of B2 and D. Well, do we have the uropathological forms of the Shrikia coli? Uropakin, that's so to say a place which was in the urinary bladder, in the urinary tracts, you might see they are even represented inside the glomerula. And this is the place where the Shrikia coli actually gets to by using this kind of small part as manosa. Uroplakin on the surface of cell, there, there are quite a lot of them. These are some special proteins, and in the end this is manosa. Manosa, which is going to connect to the small pocket on the surface of pili, of Shrikia coli, of those pilis, and the pocket of receptor binding domain. And they just connect to each other, and that's the main molecular mechanism of pathogenicity. And that's why the usage of it is the most principal in case we would like to fight with, and to cure, not to cure, but to fight with the recurrences and just to delay the each possible recurrence. So the Shuhia Koli, which leads to this plankton-like life, they're isolated, they're completely different, but those Shuhia Koli's, which are performing the biofilm, they just exchange the genes, exchange the virulent factors, adhesion factor, and they are sharing the nutritive, nutritive substances, some of them die, some of them still continue to live. This is a huge biofilm communities where it's impossible to get through. And what does happen? This biofilm media, this is just some simple medium where we have Shrikia coli, is multiplying, and over there where we have Manoza, we have less of Shrikia coli, we have less those Shrikia coli colonies. So what's it all about? Manoza, it's not just killing those Shrikia Koi's, it's not allowing for them to communicate with each other, to exchange those nutritive factors. The, each Shrikia Koi is much more performing their life in isolation, and that's how they were vulnerable. And that's an extremely important point, when Manoza is just 
disrupting those biofilm of Escherichia coli. As it was shown in this type, this is the antibiotic resistance, the antimicrobial resistance Escherichia coli. They do usually its strain, its level, and also the add of metodoprenyl fiptazexolol does not influence its level. And also the usage of those inhibitor factors of PILI, of Fibria, does decrease its level. And that's an extremely important. These are some kind of in vitro trials and studies. But in order to understand what we are fighting with, we need to know the pathophysiology of this bacteria, and we do need to know how to fight with it. Different kind of strains of adhesion factors, these are some special strains, and adhesion to the cells of the bladder, of the urinary bladder, and this J96 serotype, when it was located inside the Manoza culture, the adhesion was decreased. So those kind of pathophysiological links, so those pilies which they used in order to get to uropoikin, they are blocked and they do not have the possibility to perform the adhesion with those uropoikin part. The decreased amount of colonies of Shruhia coli with Manoza medium inside the urine after we just add manosa and also what is extremely important we do decrease the extracellular colonies as well so they also decreased in amount which is extremely important in the point of talk that once it gets through the mucosa of the urinary bladder they continue to live and to multiply in there over there you may see the simple medium the dosage of manosa so once we increase the dosage twice it decreases the amount of colonies of Escherichia coli in urine and over here we talk about the action of antibiotic which was not forking in those kind of colonies. So what do, we, what do we mean when we talk about dosages? When we have some kind of amount of manosa intake, it is not fermented inside the intestine, it is just absorbed inside the intestine and then it is and then it is just working. So the small dosages of manosa, 150, 500 milligrams, they are not going to give the wanted results. That's why 2,000, 3,000 daily dosages, they might create the constant contrast or the dosage enough to fight with Shruhi Koi. So when we talk about the two groups, control and uh, study group, the prescription of Manoza, the prescription of uh, less antibiotic and also the combined usage of antibiotic and trimetoxazole and also it decreases the concentration of Shruhi Koi inside the urine and inside the urinary bladder. So this trial which I've started with, this study which I've started with, which was published in our guidelines, it was conducted in Slovenia, in case I'm not mistaken, in 2014 and it was and it was taken into account just two groups, the placebo controlled group and also the Manoza group. And all of those in two groups there was a proven recurrence of urinary tract infections which was happening for quite a lot of times and only this group of patients, of female patients, were included into this trial, were enrolled in this trial. And over there you may see that prescription of Dimanoza for six months was delivering the delay and the recurrence was happening just in 15% and nitrofurantine in 24%. Just prescribe nitrofurantine, it was 50 milligrams during six months and nitrofurantine has its own side effects like dyspepsia, neuropathic pains. There might be some influence on the liver, on the nervous tissue and over there you may see that in Patsepa group they avoid the recurrence in 60%. So when we talk about the delay of the recurrence, you may see that in Manosa control group, in Manosa group, sorry, the first amount of recurrence was happening on the 31st day and with nitrofurantine group it was on the 21st day and on 28th day in case there was a placebo group. So by saying that we see that Manosa prescription it dramatically delays the recurrences and I hope that those kind of episodes, those recurrences, those exacerbations, they had not, they were not that clinically significant and they were much easier to be corrected with the same nitrofurantine drugs because in my practice I still use the first line and prescription of nitrofurantines and then the second and the third line I prescribe other antibiotics like phosphomycin for example. 
I am really extremely against prescription of torquinolones in order to prevent the diseases of the urinary tract infections. And over there you may see what Maneza is doing, what she mentioned before. It just stops the cooperation of those cells and it's much easier to fight with those cells on its own while they are not in biofilm. And this is the linear graph which shows that on the background of Dima Noza the recurrences are less and there is a better delay to the recurrence. And in case we are not going to do anything, this is the incidence of the recurrence which are going to appear. And once more, just the last slide to show the strains of the Ischerichia coli and also symptom asymptomatic bacterial urea, they are completely different. And they have different processes which are happening inside the urinary bladder because those genes, they just lead to completely different reactions and asymptomatic bacterial urea which we often want to destroy with antibiotics, we should not treat it. We should not use antibiotics according to the modern guidelines. And that's where we use Dimanoza as an asymptomatic bacterial urea therapy. Thanks for your attention.